Welcome to section 8, pointers. Fortunately, we've avoided using pointers for the most part until section 6 when I asked you to use the standard flags package, in which case you had to use pointers, but I said just use it and don't worry about it. And the examples there um, for this flags package is very easy, very straightforward, and you really don't have to think about pointers. All right, so what are we going to be doing in this section? We're going to be looking at what is a pointer. I'll go through a number of slides and I'll try a number of different ways of trying to explain what a pointer is so that if you've never seen a pointer before, hopefully you come away from this first lecture and by the end of this section, really understanding pointers. If you've seen pointers before and you're scared of them, please give this a try and come with an open mind. I'll try to um, illustrate exactly what pointers are and hopefully take away that fear. We'll talk about the nil pointer value. We'll see why it's special. Um, of course, we will look at using pointers because then there would be no point if we couldn't, <laughs> no pun intended. Um, there wouldn't be any purpose to pointers if we didn't know how to create them and how to use them. And so we'll talk about pointer dereference. And then a little bit more advanced stuff, it would be looking at why pointers are so important. And this really shines when we look at functions and pointers. And then we'll talk a little bit about pointers to pointers. We're not going to go too crazy because this is still an introductory course. So we really don't have to delve too deep. So what will we be learning in lecture one? We'll, of course, try to get our hands around what is a pointer. And we'll do so by looking, like I said, at a number of drawings and illustration and animation. We'll try our best to make pointers not scary at all. We'll look at declaring a pointer. And again, we'll look at the nil value um, in terms of when you declare a pointer, what is the rule does the nil value serve and so on. So let's start with memory. Now, as we know, everything that you have in a program is stored in memory. So if you have no memory in a computer, you couldn't possibly run a program because the CPU, the processor, the central processing unit, the thing that actually fetch your code and execute it, fetches it from memory. So without memory, you won't have anywhere to store any variables. Even your code itself is stored in memory, not just the variables you create, like a variable to create to store a name, but the functions and what represent your application is stored in memory. So we need memory. But now I want to just think about memory and variables. So where are variables stored in memory? Now, here's an illustration. We will imagine memory as a set of boxes, okay? And each box represents one byte or eight bits. That's how we are going to imagine the units of data that you can store in memory. Now, if you've ever heard somebody says, oh, I have 10 gigabytes of memory or eight gigabytes of memory, this is what they're saying. They're saying, I have eight gigs and gigs is a measurement of how many bytes so you have one byte and then a thousand byte is called a kilobyte a million bytes is called a megabyte and a thousand megabytes is called a gigabyte right a thousand megabytes is a billion right so a thousand million is a billion but in memory we don't say a billion bytes we say a gigabyte okay so now i'm looking at memory here piece of memory that is just whatever it looked like 10 boxes on top and 40 bytes okay now let's imagine that I need to store some variables so let's say I have a variable called price and the type of it is float 64 now we know that float 64 requires 8 bytes for this type so my price variable will occupy, let's say, these eight bytes. Now, I could have placed these eight bytes anywhere in memory, but I choose to place them as the first eight byte in this memory region that I have, okay? And so we know that price represents those eight bytes. And every time I say I wanna use the variable price, I'm always accessing whether it's reading or writing to those eight bytes, because those eight bytes are what I need to store a float 64 value. Okay, 
So if I were to create a second variable, like let's say count, and count is of int 32, we know that int 32, because it's 32 bits, it requires four bytes, right? So 64 bits divided by eight, remember, eight bits per byte is how I get eight bytes. 32 bits with eight bits per byte give me four bytes. So this tell me I need these four bytes, or at least four bytes somewhere, to represent or to store an int 32 value. And so now I'll say that our count is at this location. Again, I'm going through pains to make sure that you at least understand these fundamentals before we get into, before I could show you the link to pointers. So definitely make sure you understand that each time we access the price variable, we need to access eight bytes because it's float 64. Every time we use the count variable because it's in 32, I need to use four bytes, whether I'm reading four bytes or writing to four bytes. Okay, so so far we've seen two variables in memories. Let's add a third variable. So this time I have an is on variable, which is of type Boolean, and it only requires one byte. Now, if you remember that we said that each unit of memory is eight bits, so I cannot get smaller than eight bits. And even though a Boolean value is just simply either through or false, in which case I only really need one bit because I cannot access a single bit for now, we just have to use eight bits, which is just one byte. So Boolean is one byte. And we saw this when we look at the data size in section two, when we look at the different types of um, data and then how many bytes are required to store that value. Okay, so now we have another block or a byte, sorry, of memory that's being used. Uh, a block usually refers to several bytes, but just a byte, we have one byte that's being used to store our is on um, value. All right, so we put that there. So now I'd like to change how we look at memory in the sense that instead of putting the variable names over the memory, we'll just color it differently. So the green boxes represent our price, the brown one represent count, and blue represent our Boolean is on value. All right, so let's zoom into memory a little bit. And we're just looking at the memory itself. And we remember that the green is price and brown is count and blue, but that's okay, it doesn't matter. We just, we have a mental map that eight bytes are being used for something, four bytes are used for something else, and then one byte is used for something else. What I'd like to do next is to label each byte. So this looks like an array, if you remember. And so we can attach a index or ID to each one of these boxes. So that's the first row of bytes I have labeled. The first byte I've called it byte zero. The second one is byte one. And this looks like an array. And a lot of times when we talk about memory and we treat memory, we treat it as a huge array of bytes. And so I can also label the second row and of course the third row and finally the fourth row you could imagine. So let's zoom back out a little bit and the labels or the index that I have on my byte location, they're still there, but because we have zoomed out, we're not seeing that right now because we're not focused on that. The only other thing I want to do is to simplify how we label. So we know that the very first byte there was zero and then it went from zero all the way through nine and then the next row it started with 10. So what I'll do is I'll put the starting address of each byte for each row. Does that make sense? So in the first row, the starting address is zero. In the second row, the starting address is 10. The third row, the starting address is 20. And the fourth row, the starting address is 30. So that gives me a quick way if I'm looking for byte 22. Well, I know I have to jump down to the third row because the starting address there is 20. And then um, my 20, byte 23, 22, sorry, would be here because this would be 20, 21, 22. Make sense? So if we want to talk about the address for our Boolean value, well, we know it's going to be 20 something. So this is 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. So byte 27 is my, where I have my is on Boolean variable. Okay, so let's bring back our variables now. And 
Now we can say, not only do we know the variable names, the types, and how many bytes they occupy, but we can also, also tack on the memory location, right? Which is quite literally, if you read this backward, the location in memory. And the location in memory is simply where they start, the lo byte location they start at, and the byte location they end. So we know for price, this byte location starts at zero all the way through seven, right? Because remember, it's eight byte, but since we're starting at zero, well, it must end at seven. Similarly, for our count, byte location is from address 10 through 13. And for our Boolean value, we already counted it before, it was address location 27, and that's literally the only place. So we don't need to say that it ends at 27 because it's the same value, just one value, one byte, okay? So now that we know the memory locations, which include the start and ending for each variable, now we can say that oh, we really don't need the end location, right? That's because if we have price and we know its type is float, that tells us that it requires eight bytes. So all we really need to know is where it starts in memory. And then we can calculate from the other information, the fact basically how many bytes it needs based on the fact that we know its type, then we can calculate the ending location. Right. So we don't need that extra information of the ending location. But what is that start lo lo um, location? That's just the address in memory. We can just call that the address in memory. So zero is the address of price. But because we know price is a float, we can say, well, it's really the next eight bytes. But really, all we have to do is say price is at memory location zero and count is at memory location 10. I'm is on the boolean is at memory location 27 and then because we can look up the type then we can go for that extra piece of well how many bytes are we really using for price and how many bytes are we using for count but we can just start thinking about the memory the starting address and say this is the address in memory of that thing if i want to know where price is i really just need to tell you where in memory to start looking and if you know the type then you know how many bytes to use but that's the key thing, is that if I give you just the memory location alone, without any information about the type of thing that's being stored there, you would not know if it's a float or a count or, a, I'm sorry, a float64, in 32 or a Boolean. So I still need to give you the two pieces of information I need to give you, the memory address, the starting address, and what type of variable is stored or what type of the value um, the type of the value that's stored at a memory location, right? Remember, we're storing values in memory and they have type. And so by doing that, you can infer then that what we have when we combine the address and the type is a pointer. So this is what a pointer is. A pointer is simply knowing the starting memory location of something that's stored in memory and what type of thing is stored there. Let me say this another way. A pointer is simply the starting memory location of some value of a certain type. Notice the type is very important because if I just simply give you starting memory location alone, that is not enough to tell you what type of value, the value, how you should interpret that value. So that all, that is all a pointer is. Notice we're combining two things. We're combining the memory address with the type and then we say that that's a pointer and the way we differentiate a pointer from the actual thing that's stored it we just put a star in front of it so when we have a value that's a pointer that says oh this is not just any regular integer value or whatever this is a special type of value this value is a memory location and information about the thing that is stored there and we call that a pointer so take a second to digest that at this point don't if you're using the word pointer scares you then substitute it with oh it's just a memory location and the type of thing that's stored there and then we represent it with the star and the type that's it right so anytime somebody say we have a pointer just immediately think all they're talking about is a memory location and since memory location alone would not tell me anything now i need a type 
And so what type are we talking about? Yeah, some type. It doesn't matter what type it is, but it's some type. I need it. But once I know the type, now I can just simply say that value that I have is star whatever the type. We'll see more of this. Like I said, we're going to go through pains to try and make this clear. So at the end of this lecture, and definitely by the end of this section, the, the goal is so that you are not scared of pointers. Okay, so now that we know what we call a pointer, now we can look at definition. First, we start off with illustration. Now we can look at the definition. And so if we look at the definition of what a pointer is, it says a pointer is an appropriate type that can hold a numeric value. And this comes from the Golang documentation, okay? Language certification. Can hold a numeric value. Remember that numeric value is what? An address in memory representing the location of a value of the type in memory, which is exactly what we just saw. We saw that a pointer was nothing more than something that has a numeric value representing the location in memory holding this type. So this location in memory, location zero, has value that represents type float. And so the pointer is nothing more than combining these two and saying, well, yep, that is a, that's the location in memory that holds that type. And you represent that fact, this combining of the memory address with the type that's stored it by calling it a pointer and you put star float 64. So float star float 64 is a type. What kind of value you can store in this type? Any memory address where there is a float. What is the this type? It's a pointer to an integer. What can what value can you store in a variable of type int 32? Any memory location where there is an int 32. When I have a variable of pointer of type pointer boolean, what can I store in it or what value is stored in there? Any memory location where there is a boolean. Okay? Just like when I have boolean value a boolean variable, I can store in it any boolean value, right? A boolean value is either true or false, so I can store any one of those. When I have an integer 32 variable, what value can I store it in it? Any in 32 value, any in 32 value. Similarly, when I have a variable of type pointer to in 32, I can store any memory location where there is an in 32 value. Okay, so I think we sufficiently beat that to death, but let's just read it again. A pointer is an appropriate type that can hold a numeric value, and that numeric value is a memory address representing the location, representing the location of a value of that type in memory. Well, it says of the type, but of that type in memory. All right. In other words, a pointer of type int can hold the numeric value representing the memory location of an int value or in, of any int value in memory. So there's an important caveat here. We can only get the memory location or the address, right? So we can use memory location and memory address interchangeably. We can only get the memory location of a non-constant value stored in memory. And the reason for that is it should really say non-constant or non-literal value. If I type the string hello, that's a literal value. If I try to get the address of that and say, well, where is it stored? Well, it's, I, I can't do that. And um, it's not that though the hello string, hello world string is not in memory. It is in memory. It's just that where it is in memory is of no consequence to us. It doesn't matter because if my program uses hello, the literal string, well, the compiler just figure out some place to put that at runtime, and then it doesn't really matter. And it places a very special place, and we don't need to get into that in this course. And the same thing with constants. If I use the constant, I create a constant for, let's say, um, the number four. That's a literal value, and I say it's a constant. I don't really care where it's actually stored in memory. But if I store the number four in a variable, then I would like to get the address of that variable in memory. And the really, the important thing here is that when we have um, get pointers or we get the memory location of a variable, it's so because we want to do something with it. And so getting the address of like a literal or a constant doesn't really help us much. 
because we can just retype the constant or, you know, using the constant variable name, um, the ver constant name, or for a literal, we just reuse that name too. Okay. So let's see if we can try and understand how pointers might be used. And so let's say we have the value 1737. That's just a number. So I picked a, a random number. And so we know this is a value, 1737. It's an integer, and we need some bytes to store it. So for us, we will say, well, this has to be stored in memory, and so we need a variable. But, you know, we have to be stored somewhere, and we have to be able to reference it, so we're going to use a variable. So let's call this variable count, and the variable has this value, 1737. We also know that this has to be stored somewhere in memory. That's the whole thing. When we have a variable, it has to, we have to have memory in order to store that variable because we wouldn't be able to store anything. So for our example, we're going to say that the address of this variable count is address 156. And based on what we've covered already, we know that all we really need to know is the starting address because if we know the type, and if I say count, for example, is in 32, then we know it's how it's the set of byte range that I'm using is 156, 157, 158, and 159, right? So I only really need to know the starting address, and based on the type, then I can figure out what that range is, okay? Now, both the value and address are numbers. We see that, right? They're both numbers. One number represents the value, the other one represents location and memory. And regardless of whatever type I'm using, the address is always going to be a number. That's why if you go back to the definition of what a pointer is, it says a pointer is an appropriate type that can hold a numeric value. So all pointers are going to have numeric value. That's because we looked at our little table that we had before and we saw that regardless of which point or which type we're talking about, whether it was float, int, or boolean, they all had numeric, because they're, they're in memory. Every memory location is just a numeric um, value to represent that memory location, okay? So let's go back now to our previous slide. So since every um, address is just a numeric value, and in our example that we're doing now, both the value and the address is just a number, then we can store that number into yet another variable. Even if the value we had was a string, its address would still be a number because it has to be in memory somewhere. And then we can store that address into another variable, right? It would be a pointer appropriate for a string, so it would just be a pointer to a string. Quite literally, we're saying this memory location is, contains a string or points to a string, right? And so if we imagine creating another variable called pcount, then the value of p count is 156. Now the type of it is going to be a pointer to an int because that's what it is, a pointer to our int. But then that variable p count is also in memory. Guys, remember we're storing it in a variable. So it too has an address. So you can see how things can get kind of weird. It look like if you're going down a rabbit hole because now in order to store the address of count in a variable, we had to create a second variable, but that second variable p count itself needs to be in memory. And so it also needs an address, a memory location, but it doesn't really matter. All we really need to know is that every variable is stored somewhere in memory. And then that memory has an, is, has an address because it's in memory and we can get it. And so that is what it would look like if we could somehow get the address of our count variable and then um, stored into a second variable called p count. And we don't have to stop there. Like we say, the count variable could be in 32. Well, what is the count, the type of the p count variable? Well, it's just pointer to in 32. Because if we know the type is pointer to in 32, which is represented by that little star in front of the type, well, we know that this value, the value in that variable, represent a memory location that if we went there, because we're talking about in 32, we'll just have to use four bytes and we could read four bytes and we'll get the value, okay? And we can create a second variable, a third variable, sorry, 
in which now we store the address of p counter. Let's call this pp counter. And we, you know, we can get sort of crazy. But you can see that we can get the address of that second variable stored in yet another variable. And so now what we're saying is we have a pointer to a pointer to an int32. And notice every time we get the address of something, we try to create a, a type of it, or we just add on a star. That's it. Okay. We, we're not going to get too crazy about the whole pointer to pointer, right? Um, this introductory course, and frankly, um, there are very few times when you really need to use pointer to pointer in Go. If you're using language like C and C++, it's, it, the usage comes up sort of often, but in Go, very rarely. And I would advise that you really don't think about using it too often. Okay, so I think we've talked a whole lot, but we haven't seen any code yet. And the idea was to make sure that you sort of feel comfortable with what is it that we're doing. So now let's to take a look at a little bit of code of how we sort of declare a pointer at least. So let's jump to our Visual Studio Code Editor at this point. So here I am my Visual Studio Code Editor, Section 8, Lecture 1, and we'll start with a fairly empty Go application, um, very simple. And so let's start by seeing how to declare a pointer. So this is all I've changed from what we had before. I've simply imported FMT package, and declare a pointer. I'm going to print out the value of that pointer, and I'm using this new print specif format specifier called p. And so I want to show you the difference between using percent %v and percent %p. If you read up on the FMT package, which is something that I asked you to do, I think, in lecture two or something, um, or sorry, section two, uh, you would see that there were a number of format specifiers, T, V, D, and so on. And for the most part, V is smart enough to use the appropriate um, specifier formatting based on the type. So V is a sort of a catch-all that says, you know, you choose, based on the type of the thing I want to print out, you choose what's the best way to pr for, print it out. Um, but in this case, I want to also show you the same variable being printed with the two. Okay, so let's look at our declaration again. We said that a pointer is a type. And by putting star in front of the type says, what I really want to be able to do is create a variable that can owe a numeric value to a memory location that has an integer. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying that the p count here can hold a numeric value, which is some memory location that has a integer value, all right? No, we did not say where that memory location is um, because we would have to have an int in order to get the address of that integer to store in p count. Okay, but for now we're not doing that. We're simply creating a variable. Now, what's interesting about this is this is going to have, of course, a devolved value, which we'll see. Let's run our code. Now we have to get to section eight, of course, lecture zero one, and and so if I run this, I see that pcount has the value nil when I print out with percent %v to say what's the value. And then it shows me 0x0. What is 0x0? Well, when I print it out using percent %p, I'm actually saying print this out as a pointer. And when we print out pointer, we usually use the hexadecimal um, numeric um, representation. And the reason for that is memory addresses can be really long. And if we use byte, it would be, you know, if it's 64 bit addressing, it will be 64 bits to look at. And if we use decimal, it'll still be a fairly large number, but hexadecimal give us a nice compact format um, to look at. And so when we declare a pointer, its value is zero or the memory location it has is zero. And hence, if you try to interpret that, well, that is just a nil value because there's nothing at that memory location that actually represents an integer. So we say it's nil. And so that's why you see when you print out as a value, it's nil. Don't worry, in the next lecture and so on, we'll have experience with how to print out pointers and so on. So uh, let's continue and let's create some additional pointers. So what I've added is to what we had before is just a few more declarations. So 
I have declared a Boolean pointer, a pointer to a string, pointer to an in64. I can do pointer to any type. So map string is a type, so I can say I have a pointer to that. All I'm saying is again is this pmap can hold a numeric value that represents a memory location where I actually have a, the values for a map of string int. That's because maybe I've created a map before or something and I take, taken its address, which we haven't seen how to do. So all of these are just pointers declaration, but they don't, they all still have the nil value because I didn't assign anything. So we can print those out and we should expect to see all of them say nil. Now I use percent %V because it tell you the value. If I use percent %P, it would still tell me, regardless of the type of point I created, they should all have the same thing, which is the address zero, they're pointing to the address zero. Why? Because, well, that's the default value for an uninitialized pointer. So if I change this to, Do that percent p see all still point to the same has the same value so run code now they're all nil point of a boolean point of a string point of an n64 point of the map and point of the channel all have the nil value and they're in terms of the pointer value they currently have is zero so they print into memory location zero if you like but we don't really have anything stored there. So memory location zero is a special memory location that if you try to see what's there, it would actually cause your program to crash. But Golang is smart enough to say, mm, I see that this is zero, so it's nil, there's nothing there. Okay, let's continue. So in this example, I've declared my own type, which we've seen before, I think in uh, section two or section three, we look at how we can declare our own types. So I said type, SN, that's the name of my new type, is string, which means that I've created a new type called SN. It's a new name type, but it has an underlying type of string. Every type, even if you create your own type, must have an underlying type, okay, when you create your own type. And um, I have a variable, which is a pointer to my type. So even when you create your own type, you can still have pointers to this. That's because a pointer is simply <laughs> the memory location that can hold that type. And so even if your type is built in or you create it, you can always create a pointer to that. And so that's what I wanted to demonstrate here. And printing it out, same thing. We should expect to see nil. And then if we print out the you know, pointer to it, PSN address, if we try to get the address, but I say print out as a pointer, well, we should expect to see address zero also. Similarly, I create a more complex type. This time I create a structure, right? Remember how we create structure? We said person is a type and the, the type of this person is a structure. And the structure has first name, string, last name, string, and age, u, int, it. And it doesn't really matter all these different things that it has, but it is a type. And I can also create a pointer to person saying that our P person can all the memory location or address of a variable stored as a pointer or the address where you have a pointer value. And similarly, I can print this out and no surprise, it's still gonna say nil and it's still gonna say memory address zero, but let's run it anyway. And the purpose of these examples is to show you that all these pointer, regardless of type, uninitialized has the nil value, Oh, wait a second. Uh, I think I, oh, it's supposed to be that. Uh, messed that up. So let's run it again. Uninitialized have the memory address zero and the value nil. Okay. Okay. Few more examples. So in this example, now I'm looking at function pointers. Remember, functions are first class citizens in Go, and we can create function types. We did that and when we talk about functions and creating function types and anonymous functions. So if function is a type, because we can easily say, I have some type called function pointer foo, and it's a function that takes, you know, let's say float, 
64 or 32 for example and it returns you know an int a bool and a string right that could be my function type foo is some type function type that type that represents functions any function that takes a float so even if we have five functions different names of course but they can take a float as a parameter when they're called and they return these three specific type then we can say that all those functions matches our type foo so since foo is a type makes sense that we should also be able to create pointers from it and in this example what i want to show is i've created a variable called p func that is essentially just a variable that says i can be assigned the value of any function that matches this signature which is a function that doesn't return anything but takes an int and so now i want to print that out as a pointer and i want to show you what that looks like well let's do this p func address uh, let's say let's say the value for that function and then i want to say p func address and print that out like that so now i'm trying to print out the value of this p func variable and also the address okay and now let's run this and as you can see p func is nil and the address is also zero what might be a bit confusing to you is we did not use pointer we did not have to say var is you know var of p func is a pointer to a func int we did not have to say that and we could have but we don't need to and i'll show you why so let's look at another example so in this example i've written a function called goo that's the only thing i've added and goo when called prints you know i am function goo now we know that p func the variable doesn't point to anything yet because we just printed out and it says the value is nil the address is point to is address lo memory location zero just like all the other uninitialized pointers they have a um, address of um, nil so if i actually try to call a function what i'm saying is call some function at memory address zero and pass it seven but there's nothing there no no function no integer no nothing even though those that's the initial value for uninitialized pointers and i said p func is acts like a pointer and we can see that because when we print out as a pointer it shows the memory address zero so if we try to run our program now this is what i told you before that if you try to access anything at memory location zero you get this seg fault okay segmentation violation you are not supposed to try to dereference and we'll talk about dereference later anything at this memory address see that memory address zero so that causes our program to crash okay so we can't do this but since we have goo we can assign goo to p func that's because the signature of goo matches our type here goo is a function that takes an integer of value and doesn't return anything and p func is exactly that a function that takes an integer value so we can say p func is equals to goo and if we again print out the value of p func now we should see that the address will be wherever goo is in memory because we have assigned goo but note we didn't have to take the address of goo because goo's name is its address it's only when you call it then Go knows that oh what you want to do is actually call this invoke this function but just by using the name goo it is the address and so that's why when we declare a function pointer we really don't have to say that we're creating a pointer because it's already a pointer when you create a function type okay and the function name itself is a pointer so we don't really have to say give me the address of this that doesn't work okay and so if we now we run our code now we can see that at first of course it was uninitialized now we have the address and notice the value of p func is the exact same thing as the address because that's what it is for a function that's what it is right now 
what if we try to create some type maybe we do something like this we let's comment out this and we say we want to create some type and it should be the address of goo right notice how we get an error ignore the call but we get an error because we cannot take the address of goo we cannot take the function the address of this function hence why it's no point in us saying that we have a pointer to that function okay so that's why when we create the function pointer here we don't really have to explicitly set that we have a pointer function pointer we have so that we have a variable that is able to hold the value of any function of that type and it turns out to be a pointer all right so one last thing now in the terms of code and then we will close it up so we've seen this before we've seen type ssn string and the structure let's revisit some of the variable the pointer variables we declared earlier so these are all the pointer variables we declared earlier and this is when we print them out we'll know that out they're going to still be nil because we haven't done anything what i want to show is that i can assign to these different types this value nil and the reason why i want to show this is to just show you that nil is a special value and it would seem that nil doesn't have a type but it sort of have a type right you know, I'm a, if nil had a type, then I could not assign it the same thing to all of these. Like, I couldn't say, for example, even though we know pointers are numeric values, I couldn't say like seven for all of these, just like that, right? Because they need to have this specific type. Like you could see here, it says, cannot assign seven, which is an integer, to the type Boolean, right? So it's not the right type, even though we know that our pointers are numerics. Well, they are numeric of a specific type though. They need to be the type that they're, they're pointing to. Okay, so why then I do not get the same error when I use nil? How is nil this magical thing that you could just assign to anything? We can assign it to pointers, we can assign it to, to maps, we can assign nil to channels, we can assign nils to, to, um, to slices. So, nil doesn't have a type until well until it needs a type because if i try to take even though i assign nil to boolean and then i say well okay let's do p bull because boolean has the value nil well then i should really be able to assign that nil value to p string no it's not the same okay so nil has a has is a special value without a type until it needs one okay um that's how i, I sort of think of it now when we print this out we'll see that even when I assign nil to it, it's the exact same as, you know, the, the default. So that's all I wanna really show there. So let me comment out this part, we'll cover this next. So let me comment this out, save that, and let's run our code again. And so you see whether it is the default value or I explicitly assign nil is the exact same thing. So that's why you really don't have to say you're assigning nil to anything because things just get nil, like not anything, but there's one or two places where you might actually want to assign a value to, of nil to something. If you want to indicate that you're no longer using it, you want to sig signal to the garbage collector that, hey, go ahead and clean that up for me. Because remember in Go, we don't do explicit cleanup of garbage. So that might be a way to signal that I no longer use, need to use that thing. Okay, so let's look at this last piece of code, and then we end. So in this case, I have a slice, right? And this is talking about other things that can also be nil. We have a map, and in this case, my pointer is an int, and the value type is pointer to person, but it really doesn't matter. I just simply have a map, and I have a channel, and here is a function type again, okay, variable. And all of these things are going to have the value of nil. And even when I assign nil to them, they all still nil. That's because how nil operate. But notice how they display. For the slice, it display as an empty array. That's because who knows that really what a slice is, is some array type thing or abstraction of an array. But even though it's nil, I can say it's just empty. And map is the same thing. The value of a map is this, but if I point it out, print it out as a pointer, 
we'll see 0x0, right? And the channel, a nil channel, will just point towards this nil. And a function pointed, printed out, well, it just shows you the address because that's the most um, obvious way to, to display a function. You can't really display the code for a function if you try to print it out. So it's always the address of that function. And for a fun uninitialized function variable, well, then it's nil. All right, I hope this makes sense. In the next lecture, we'll see how we can actually get memory addresses or pointers to store in these different variables that we can create now. And then we'll talk about the references and using them and so on. But at least hopefully this demystifies it. Please look at the supplemental material that includes your reading assignment and um, of course any additional uh, material I wanna to present to you on pointer on, in this lecture. This lecture does not have a an exercise. That's because so far all I've shown you is how to declare pointers and not how to use them. So it doesn't make sense to really come up with an exercise on just declaring pointers. All right, take care. See you in the next lecture. Welcome to section eight, lecture two, creating pointers. In the previous lecture, lecture one, we were looking at how to declare a pointer and specifically what is a pointer first of all, and then how to declare them. And then we saw that once you declare a pointer, it had an initial value of nil, regardless of the type of pointer. Now we're going to look at how you can create a pointer and give it a proper value. We're going to use the address of operator to do this. And then we're going to see a second way of creating pointers using a new function or the new function. Now let's talk about making a pointer. When we use the address of operator to make a pointer, what we're really doing is we're applying the address of operator to a variable and say, for this variable, I want you to find where it is in memory, give me that memory address. And also remember, a pointer is not only the memory address, but also the location in memory and the appropriate type that is stored there. So the address of operator is not applicable or you cannot use it on constant values, any numeric or string literal it can only be used on variables. What is the address of operator? It is this ampersand. So when I say address of operator, think ampersand. Now, people who know C, C++, this is very familiar. But if it's, this is your first time with pointers or even programming, this is the address of operator, and it's also used in C, C++. That's essentially where it came from. So as an example, let's say I had a variable um, called count, and it has the value 173. 7, 1737. We know that's an integer. We can get the address or the location on memory and type of value that's stored at that address by applying the address of operator to the variable count. And now what we'll have stored in p count is a pointer which says the address or memory location where it is, where you can find the number 1737. Remember, if I'm storing a number 137, 1737 in memory, in a variable, I need space, place to store it in memory. And that location is what is going to be stored in pcount along with the fact that, you know what? What you have stored there is an integer. And so we call that a pointer because it's going to say that pcount points to or has a value that points to this memory location that has this type. So you can know not only where something is in memory, but how to, to manipulate it, right? Because if we just had locations alone, like we talked about in the previous lecture, that doesn't tell us enough. We need location and the type of data that's stored there or the type of the value that's stored there. So as you said, the address of operator is this ampersand and you can use it to get the address of a variable. So in our example just now, we had the count variable, which we said had the value 1,737, and it's of type int. When we use the ampersand or address of operator, it's almost as if it's a mapping function, and we can send our variable into this special function, the address of function, and what pops out the other side is a pointer, which tells us the address and type of data that is stored there. So uh, I sound like if I'm being repetitive, but I really want to drive this on because I said in the previous lecture that pointers is something that confuses most people. And so I want to take my time and just really build on it and introduce you to 
every concept one at a time and with number of examples. Okay, so once we have this mapping function, the address of operator, we can apply it to basically any variable because anything that's stored in memory, we can say, hey, what is the location and type of that thing? And so in the first case, when we add count and we send that through the address of operator and we get a pointer, well, we can store that value in another variable. And since this value is now stored in a variable, right? And it's pcount, it's called pcount, that's the name of the variable, but its value is the address of where the count variable is in memory. Uh, well, that value, sorry, the value 1737 is in memory and the type of it. We can apply the address of operator on that and get its address also. So this address of operator is very, very powerful. You can apply it on any variable and you can keep doing this over and over and getting address um, pointers, storing them in variables. And because they are now stored in variable and they occupy some place in memory, then you can again, just apply the address. You can do it, but we're not gonna keep doing it. Okay, so this is our last indication, but notice how the type of the variable changes with an additional star. Now, another thing you can do is go backwards. So once you have, let's say, the address 400, which is a pointer to a pointer to a pointer to int, we can now go backward and say, oh, what does this contain? And at that loca location, we will find the value for the previous pointer. And then we can go back again. We're not going to do that in this lecture, that is for the next lecture, but I just wanted to at least let you know that not only can you go forward, and sort of have this link, but you can traverse this link backwards, okay? And you can use in the pointer that you have stored in ppcount, which is the memory location 400 and, you know, three pointers that end, we can dereference and go all the way back and get back to our value 1737. Again, we're not gonna do it, but I want to let you know, the more time I repeat this thing, <laughs> hopefully, um, or repeat these ideas, hopefully, and these concepts, hopefully it's going to sink in. So if you get it already, great. If you don't um, quite feel comfortable with it, hopefully, hopefully the repetition and the number of different ways I'm trying to illustrate it, drive the point home. Okay, so we've seen this diagram before. This is a diagram we saw in the previous lecture and we said, look, if we have some things stored in memory, um, we can ignore the variable name, and just know that oh, at memory location zero for the first eight byte, we had something stored there. In this example that we're, or the example we're doing in lecture one, we call that count. And we said it, it was, you know, some, some float values that float value, sorry. And it had eight bytes, and then we had another um, variable that was four bytes, and so on, and we had a Boolean value. Well, if you look at this and we're just looking at memory and we know which part of memory is used because it's highlighted and our table at the bottom we really don't have the verbal names all we really know is that this memory location we have this type of value and therefore what we can say is that we can create pointers okay and we have these pointers on on the left hand side right of course we've left out the value there but those are the pointers pointer to float pointer to int yada so we can then say that though these set of other bytes at start at memory address 30 and going all the way through to the end, so from 30 to 39, we can say that that represent some other type of value that's stored in memory. And this time we can say, well, it's a string, all right? We can say at memory location 30, there's a string, and we need not worry if this is actually enough for a string or not. That is not important right now. All we're gonna say is a string is stored at this in this memory location for, the, for these set of bytes. And I will assume that that's enough. And so now we can say that we have a pointer to a string. So what is the variable name? Well, we don't know, we don't care. That is not important for what we, uh, when we look at memory this way and we have pointers. So if we can know what is in memory and the type of it, which a pointer tells us where it is and what type it is, the variable name sort of irrelevant. So previously we were creating pointers from variables. So we can skip that and just create pointers. And to do that, 
we can use this new function to get the address of memory allocated for some type, whatever type we request. So as an example, let's say we were to call a new function and pass it the type string. What we're saying is go to memory, find a piece of memory that's not being used, that is big enough to hold a string, and then return me that um, pointer. And so it returns you the memory address and it says, hey, guess what? At this location, you're actually pointing to a string. And so we can now store that, the return value from new function, into a variable called pstring. And notice we did not have to first create a string variable and then take the address of it. This is sort of a shortcut when we know that our, what we really want is just memory to store something of a certain type. And we don't first have to create a variable of that type. And so this is equivalent to if we had first created a variable s that is an empty string and then take the address of it. It is the exact same thing because in the first case, when we actually say use new, it zeroes out the memory for us. So it's like an empty string. And if it was a numeric type we were asking for, it would have zeroed it out too. And it would have been the same exact thing as if we had to create an integer variable of initial value zero and then, you know, take the address of it. The only thing to notice here is that in the previous example, when we were saying count is equals to 1737 and then take the address of that, that memory location was already initialized with the value we want. When we use the new function, we're not getting to initialize that memory location with the value we want. We get a memory location which is all zeroed out, but it's allocated and ready for us to use for that particular type, but then we have to set it. So, of course, um, if we have this value now, we can store that to a string. And so you can see the three-step process or two-step process if you like, of creating a variable, then taking the address of it and storing it into a not a variable. We can shortcut that by just simply using new, especially when we just want the initial um, zero value for a type. And there are other instances where we just want to use pointers and then we can initialize it however we want afterwards. Okay, so enough talking. Let's jump and take a look at some code and then we'll have a review supplemental video. But for now, let's jump to our Visual Studio Code Editor and get some practice with creating pointers using the two ways we've just illustrated, the address of operator and the new function. So here I am in my Visual Studio Code Editor, just as before or as usual, we're in section eight, lecture two, and I have some examples that I will be going through. And we'll start with a very simple Go file. I'll close the Explorer to give us some space. So our very first example, is just reviewing and remembering that we can declare a pointer like this. We can say var pcount is a pointer to an int, and of course it has the nil value. And I can run this just to jog your memory. So, and so when we have a pointer with a zero value, when we try to print it out, it often prints out nil. And we'll see slight exception to that um, soon but generally pins out nil. And if we try to ask for the address of it using percent %p, it tells us, well, okay, we have the zero value or address zero. But if we ask for the value of it, it says, well, this is a nil value. Remember that nil is a special type of value. So, okay, let's take a look at now at creating pointer using an existing variable. So now that we have another example, notice the only thing I have changed is that now, instead of saying that I want to print out p count as a pointer, I'm saying, let's print out the type of it. So I'm asking Go to tell me the type, which we know, but um, we're asking Go to tell us the type. And then what I've done is I've created a variable and I've assigned the value 1737. And so here's something for just illustration. Imagine I wrote a function called get address of variable and I can pass it a variable and it would get me the address of it. Imagine that I could write this function. So I cannot write this function because I have to do some magic to get the, the address of the variable that has been passed to the function. Because notice, if I actually try to pass count here, that is not the address. Even if I take the address of i, that's a different variable because a copy, remember, we're always copying function parameters in Go, right? Whether it's a deep copy or a shallow copy, we always do a copy. 
So these are two different variables. So that wouldn't be correct. I'd have to do some magic. So imagine, however, that oh, I could do the magic and get the variable, the address of this variable count. That is, and, and this is only for illustration purposes. Remember, I cannot do it. I stress, I cannot do this. Okay, I have to do magic, which I cannot do. But what I can do instead of trying to write this magical function is simply use the address of operator on that variable. Okay, and that is the same as if I had, was able to write this function. So I hope that is not confusing. So now I can use address of operator on this variable and get the address of it. And now I'm simply going to print, use this exact same line, and print that out. This time I'm printing the value of count. I'm saying not only print, remember we print a nil, I point to it a nil value, we get nil. And then if we try to print it as an address, we get zero. So now I'm saying print the value of that, p count, print it as a pointer, and then also tell me the type. Okay? And so let's run that, clear the screen a little bit, and run this code. And now you can see at first p count was nil, of course, when I initialize it, the type is pointer to int. And notice when I say what is the value of it, when it's zero, it says nil, unless I specifically ask the printer as a pointer, then it would tell me zero x. But when there's a value, it prints it out as a pointer. And so percent V is smart enough to choose the most appropriate type to print it out as, value to print it out as or a most appropriate type really. And so it's saying, oh, you know what? There's a pointer and it has a value, so let me use percent %p. And so that's what it does. So both of these, in this case, give me the same thing. And from now on, you're gonna see I'm gonna drop percent %p because percent %v is pretty much gonna do the right thing for us, unless we specifically ask, know that we want to see a pointer. And then of course, the type is still pointer to int. So that is simply how you get the address of something by using the address of operator. So let's look at some more examples. This is a slightly different example than before. Instead of having an integer variable with a value, let's say 1737, now I have created a string variable. And the same thing, notice I'm using the address of operator on that variable, the string variable. And so I will see the address. And because I'm using percent %v and that value is not going to be zero, I should be able to see that as an address. Now, remember what we said in the previous lecture? We said that our addresses, which are just numbers, are printed out using the hexadecimal numbering system because the numbers can be really long and hexadecimal allow you to sort of shorten them and they're easier to read. Well, we haven't talked much about hexadecimal, but we talk about it a little bit, I believe, in section two, and I give you some re reading material on where you can go learn more about hexadecimal, binary numbers, and so on. Okay, and so then of course there's the value which we should expect to just be Jane Smith. So let's run our code. And that's what we get. The address of name is this, which is we know is a pointer value. And so this is some place in memory where we can go and find a string value. Okay, let's look at some more examples. So in this example, um, we know that oh, if we have a count variable, we can get the address of it. We can store it in yet another variable. And because we have a variable, like we said, with this address of operator, we can get the address of that variable too and store that in yet another variable. And we could keep going, but of course we're not. But what we will do is print it out and we'll see, remember if we had that table, we were seeing that we had this pointer to int and then pointer to pointer to int and so on. And that's exactly what we will see. And we can see that link between the two. So let's just run our code and we'll see what you, and you'll see what I mean. So. And so here is Kong's value, which is 1737, and that is stored at memory location, blah, 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 0f8. We created the pointer from this ver a variable, that's all in this value, and stored it in yet another variable. And so that variable's value, of course, must match this, because that's what we said to do. We said take the pointer to that variable and store it here. But since that is also needs to be stored in memory, well, that is at some memory location, and we were able to get that memory location. And then we can take that value and store it in yet another variable. And that value itself is also stored in memory, another memory location. Well, we can make this a bit easier to read 
by sort of tacking on something else here. So let's do this. We'll see we have the type int, then pointer to int, and then pointer to pointer to the int. So, all right, so there we go. So we see count is a value. Um, count value is 1737. Its location in memory is this, and the type of this variable is int. pcount has this value, which we know is a pointer to this, and then its location in memory is this, but the type of pcount is a pointer to int. Since we store, we get the address of pcount and stored it in yet another variable called ppcount, very creative. Its value must be the address of this. And so its type, of course, and it's stored somewhere else in memory. And its type is now pointer to pointer to int. So this is where that link from int to integer pointer to pointer to pointer to int. And we can navigate back up it this way, but we'll see that using this value only, if we know that how this is the memory location that has a pointer to a pointer to an int, we can use that information to find our way all the way back to this count value. And we'll see that in the next lecture. Okay, let's move on. Here we have a few examples where we use the new function. And so notice I'm skipping creating a variable for us and simply say new int and then store that result into p count. And that is a pointer to an int. It's the equivalent of if I had created a variable count with the value zero and then take the address of it and stored it in the p count variable. Same here when I say new string is the same thing as if I had created a name variable with an empty string and then taken, took the, the address of that name variable and stored it in p name. And so we'll print out that value and the type. And there you go. We have the memory location and we have the types. Nothing too surprising there. So here are a few more examples, but this time I want to show you that when you use the new function, just like the make function, or you can pass, say make a bunch of different things, um, whether it's slices or arrays or channels or and maps, well, you can do the same. Um, you can do the same thing with the new function. Here I'm saying, give me the address of a 10 element integer array in memory. So whatever that address come back, as I know that at that location is laid out for me a 10 element array that I can where I can store integers. Similarly, we can say I want a pointer to a slice of float. Again, knowing how floats work, well, we don't have the on the line array. All we have is a pointer to this float variable. And at that point, at that location, we can store a slice value. Okay. Similarly, this is a map, a pointer to a map that maps from in 64 to a slice of complex 128. And all I'm trying to do is with these complex things is show you not with this complex in terms of type, but rather these complex types, type declaration here is to show that how the new function can create pointers to anything that you valid type that you can give to it. And here is, I'm saying, sort of make a channel that whose value or the value in that channel is a pointer to a channel of string, but then give me the pointer to where that would be stored in memory. So find some place in memory and do that for me. And that's sort of equivalent to if I had make a channel of pointer to string stored in some variable and then took the address of that variable and stored it in pch. Right, and we can run that. And all this is sort of probably boring by now, but I really want to drive the point home. Now notice something interesting. When we had the channel, and notice I'm using the same way of printing these out. I say percent %v, percent %v, percent %v. But when we had a channel, it prints the address. When we had a map, a slice, and an array, it actually tried to print those values but then it put an address of in front of it to say, what are you, I'm really giving you is the address of a 10 element array here. I'm giving the address of a slice. And then of course we print out the type here. So pointer to a slice of float and so on, right? And this is a map. Okay, let's continue. Our final example with using the new um, function is to show that our new function also work on your custom type. Remember I said any valid type. 
So whether you type out that type or you actually take that type, give it a name, like in this case, I have a type called ID. It's in my new name type on the line type of my new type ID is a string. And then I can create call new on that type using my name type and that works. Same thing if I create a struct and I give it a name, then I can also say new student and that also work. And so as you can see, when I do the value percent V of that pointer to student, notice all it says, oh, it's really the address of some student and those that student has an empty string, which you don't see age is zero because that's an integer value on sign int eight. And then the social security number is also an empty string. So that is not printed out. If we actually want to see the field name and the value, we could use Pong V and that would show us. So for example, if we put Pong V here, for example, and we run our code, it should tell us, well, okay, now we're talking about the address of a student type defined in the main package. Name has the empty string, age is zero, printing out as an hexadecimal value for whatever reason. And here is our string, which is also empty. And this is the address or memory location where you can go find all of these values. And its type, of course, is a pointer to student, which we get here. Because when we use pound v, it's saying, give me a valid Go syntax expression so that I can actually copy this and use it back in Go code. One of the things that we said you can't take the address of are constants. You can't take the address of literal values like numeric values or strings. So for example, I have a constant C with an integer value four. And we know that constants are essentially this very abstract idealized type. And so I cannot really take the value of a constant because it's not really stored in memory per se. There's a little bit more to that, but just know you can't take the address of a constant. You can't take the address of a literal and neither can you take the address of any of the other values like true and a number numeric value regards to whether it's a constant or not. So this is considered an integer literal. This is a Boolean literal. And so you cannot take the address of constant literals. Here's a floating point literal. Um, here is a complex. We're building a complex value. And still, I cannot take the, comp the, the address of that. I cannot take the address of a string literal. And you might think that oh, if I create a new type, let's say, or ID type, and I try to create a value that I can take the address of it. And no, you cannot. So all of these sort of, all of these fail. And if you try to run it, so this is also illegal, right? And if we try to run this code, we'll see that doesn't work. And it tells us we cannot take the address of any one of these things. So one last example um, in terms of taking addresses. So we look at taking address using the address of operator and also creating a pointer using the new, which doesn't require for us to have a existing variable, but instead goes into memory, find some location, and properly initialize this and say, oh, this is a pointer and return that to us. And we can then store it in a store it in a variable. Well, if you remember, we said that oh, we can have our own custom type and we can create pointers from them. But there's another way in which you can create pointers. And these are pointers from literals, but it's not the numeric literals, constants, or, you know, string literal. We cannot do that. We just saw that. So here, for example, I'm creating a student value and of course it's empty. And then I'm saying, give me the address of that in memory. So I don't have to store this in a variable first and then get the address, but this is allowed. This is legal. And we, we've, we print that out. We print out the address in memory. And of course, well, we print out the value, but if we want the address, we have to say address because we know to percent V, since it's not null, it's gonna actually try and resolve that and print it out as a struct. So we can say percent P to print this out as a pointer. And if we actually wanna see what that looks like, we can say percent Pong V there. And let's say P student and save that. 
our next example is to initialize the student. So here we have the default empty, you could think zero value of a student object, now or a student variable and a student value. And now we have a initialized student and we take the address of that initialized student and we're going to store it in our pstudent variable because they're the same type, we can do that. Our last example is using a map literal. And so we're saying we have a map type, that's a map of string to string, and here's the literal value for that map. And we could have stored that in a variable and that would just be a map that was initialized with those values, but we can take the address of that and of course try to print that out too. And so we'll see that the map value, uh, yes, if we want to print out the address, we can say we'll send p and p map. And so let's run this example and see. And there we go. So we have the student is has this value, the zero value, this address of it in memory, and the type, of course. The initialized student, notice how percent %v give us the initialized student with the values, but because we didn't use percent %pong v, we do not have the field name, we just have the value. So this is the name value, this is the age value, and this is the social security number value. And then of course, it's also pointer to student. For our map, here it is. It says it's address of a map that we're printing out, we actually went to memory since we had the address and it's non-zero and we know the type, we actually went and resolved the value and we're printing that out for you. But know that it came from an address. So that's why the address is there. If we did not store it as an address, you would just simply see map, blah, 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 without the address in front of it. And then here's because we said percent %p on that value, it actually print out the address. So notice how I said again that percent %v works differently. Like if it's a channel, it doesn't try to actually show you the values in the channel, it tells you the address. But if it's something like a map, it actually tried to go and find that value and show you the value. And of course the type. So that's it. Hopefully get creating a pointer is clear how you create a pointer, the two ways you create a pointer, and what you cannot create a pointer on. No exercise for this lecture either because everything we've done here would be the same thing that we would do in a lab exercise. And so I think we'll just repeat me asking you to now create the same thing that I've shown you how to create. And so there's nothing sort of new there. Um, if you don't understand this, try looking at the video again, post questions. And do check out the review supplemental video if you're still confused. Welcome to lecture three in section eight, using pointers. In our previous two lectures, we first look at what pointers are in lecture one. Then in lecture two, we look at how to create pointers. In this lecture on using pointers, we're gonna be introduced to the dereference operator. And this is the thing that allows us to navigate back from a pointer to the value that the pointer points to. Now, if this is a little bit weird, just try and remember when we did the review for the previous lecture in lecture two, we said there is two worlds and we could cut, sort of navigate from the left side of values to the right side of pointers. Now with the dereference operator, we're gonna be going from the pointer world. If we just have a pointer, how do we get to the value? It's gonna make sense when you see some examples. And then we're also gonna talk about some pitfalls you need to be aware of when dealing with pointers. So let's talk about using a pointer. So like I said, we're gonna use the dereference operator. So what does dereference really mean? Well, for us, it just simply means to obtain the value referenced by a pointer, okay? Or the value that a pointer points to. Again, don't worry, we will see some picture and hopefully this is gonna drive it home and with some example code. And so the dereference operator is this asterisk. That's the dereference operator. And so for example, if we have a variable with the value 1737, 1737, we know from before that we can use the address of operator to get the pointer or get a pointer for this particular variable and store it in yet another variable called pcount. So pcount now is a pointer. It has memory location and type information to say what type of thing that this memory really has stored there. 
Well, with the dereference operator, we can apply it to that pointer and we get back the value. What we will get back is actually 1737 stored in the value count two. Again, if this is a little bit abstract, we'll keep going, looking at even more examples and see if we can nail it down. So we use the dereference operator to get the value stored at the memory location indicated by the pointer. So once again, let's assume that we have this variable pconc, and what we're saying is we can take this and send it through the dereference operator. Think of the dereference operator as something that, you know, you can just send some value through, just like oh, we said we can send a variable uh, value through a address of operator and how the other side pops the pointer. Well, now we're taking a pointer and we're sending it into the dereference operator and out pops the other side, the value that's stored there. We can use dereference operator on any pointer. Now, remember when we had a variable, we said how you can use the address operator on any variable to get its address. And so same thing with the, the dereference operator. If we have a pointer to a pointer to count, let's just, that's the name of the variable. And it has some memory location and it says, well, you know what? I'm actually a pointer to a pointer to int. Notice the two stars there. Well, then we can pass that through the dereference operator and out comes, it strips off one of those pointer, um, one of the stars and out come a, another pointer. This time it says, there's a memory location and just a pointer to an int. And then we cannot do this again. We can take that value, run it through the dereference operator and now we expect to get our integer value. So, okay, so time to jump to some code and let's see what's going on. Here I am in my Visual Studio Code Editor, just as before and always, Section 8, Lecture 3, and let's close the Explorer sidebar to give us some more room. So the code I have here is just looking at having a variable with the value, variable count with the value 1737. I take the address of that variable, which we've done in the previous lecture, I store it in yet another variable. So now I've added one line of code, and it's basically using the dereference operator, which is star. And the way we use it is we apply the star before, so it precedes the point of value we want or a variable we want to dereference. And it must come exactly before it with no space in between. So we can see that now we have p count and we're saying dereference that, give me its value and give me its type of that dereference value. What we should expect is when we dereference this pointer, p count, we should get back the value of 1737. And if we ask for the type of 1737, it should be int also, which should match this first line. So let's run the code. And that is exactly what we get. It matches exactly this, where we have the same value and we get back the same type. So here I am with another example, and we have a, our student struct type. The interesting thing here is that I'm creating a pointer from a student literal. Then I get the pointer of that pointer, right? So now I have a pointer to a pointer to a student. And that is what we'll print out here. We'll print out its value and its type, and we should see it's a pointer to pointer to student. The next thing I'll do is because I have a pointer to a pointer, I can dereference this twice. And notice how I just simply double up on the dereference operator. Again, no space. I precede the pointer value with it. And we should be able to get back to a student, and we should see the type is student. So let's run our code. And yep, there we have it. We have our pointer pointer is this, which we don't really care. It's somewhere in memory, but it's telling us that oh, there's a pointer to a pointer to a student type that's defined in the main package. And because we dereference it twice, we get back that value, which was an, a literal value. We never stored in any variable anywhere. And of course, the type of it is a student. No surprise there, but just want to show that we can apply the dereference operator multiple times. So I say that we can dereference any pointer, but one of the things that we have to be careful of is that we cannot dereference a nil value. I remember if we just declare a pointer, by default, it has the nil value. So here's an example of that. We have a pointer to student, 
but we did not assign it any value. So the value is nil. And we'll see that by printing out the value of that pointer and the type. And we'll still see that it's going to say, you know, nil and then pointer to student. But this line in which we try to dereference that nil pointer is going to cause our program to panic. So let's run this. Program. And you can see the first line printed out. So P's value is nil and it's a pointer to student and that's fine. But when we try to explicitly dereference that value, it causes our program to panic and we have a segmentation violation and we talked about this already. So the way you get around this is very simple. We know how to check for nil value and we'll do that in a bit. But I wanted to show you something else. You might not be quite sure why it's working this way. But we know that though this line, when we try to dereference the P, well, we try to dereference a nil value. But what if, since we know that P points to a struct, we might think, well, okay, what about if we try to access a member of the struct? And this also causes our program to crash. And let's see. And we have the same thing too, right? We try to, why? Because we would have to be able to dereference P in order to get to the name field of it. And so it doesn't really matter if name is itself a pointer or it's just an actual string value. We still would need P itself to have a valid struct object for us to get to the field member. So this too causes our program to crash. The way we protect ourselves is every time we, when we have pointers, before you use it, unless you're absolutely sure that that pointer has a value, the best thing to do is to check it. This includes also when you use the new function to create a pointer, because what if that function failed to get any memory? And you should certainly check all pointers before you use them. Unless again, you are absolutely sure that that value cannot be nil. And so here we simply guard our, our statement with an if test. So this example is a little bit more involved. And what I did was essentially what we had before, now I have a student literal, I'll take the address of it. So that should be in P. And what I did is I print, put a little debug output with our printout. So we're going to be able to look at our output and also align it with our code and talk about it. Well, if we're dereferencing this pointer and printing it out, we can certainly dereference and store it into a variable. And so that's what we did online. We were doing online 22. And so we should expect student to be of main struct also and to have the exact same type. So no surprise there. And uh, maybe we can comment out the rest of the code and run that and see that that's indeed exactly what we get. And so, yep, just as we expected, what are we doing in this line? In this line, we're saying, well, let's use the student variable and then access the field name. And of course, we should expect this to work because we now have a student object. Okay, let's run our code again. And so we can get the student name. Let's try something else. So in this example, we are explicitly saying we want to dereference P and then we will try to access the name. So what we're expecting is that by dereferencing P, which is a valid pointer to a student, and it's not null, we should be able to get the name. And this has given us a warning. As you can see, my mouse is over it. And the reason for this is because we have two operators here. We have the star operator, which is our dereference operator, and we have the dot operator, which is the field member operator. And the field member operator binds more strongly to the value p than the star. So what is happening here is Go is going to look at p and see that it's not nil and say, oh, I can access the field name for that struct. And then it's going to try and read the value for name. And only then it's going to try and apply the dereference operator. But it, you know, our syntax um, and um, linton tool knows that our p that name is really a string, so we cannot do a dereference. That's why we get an, an error, uh, a warning already. If we try to run this code right now, it will fail because we're trying to dereference a string. We cannot dereference a string. And that might seem a little weird, 
Well, that's because the dot binds stronger to the P, the value on the left. So there's a way around this. And we can simply say, guard everything with parentheses. And we can say, what we want to do is first dereference P. And we do that by putting parentheses around it. And we want to evaluate the dereference. The, and we've been explicit about it, dereferencing of P, which gives us now a student. And then that student object is on which we want to get the name. And so this is going to work just fine. Well, what about this last example? What about if we just simply drop the star? What are we saying here? We're saying P, that social security number. Well, if we think of it, um, if you're a C or C plus program, you say, well, this P is a pointer. And yes, the dot binds to P. Well, it's a pointer. We don't actually have a student. We have a pointer to a student. So what Go is doing is actually saving you some typing. So these two are exactly the same. And so Go is saving you the extra typing of parentheses and star and saying that if you say P that field name and if P is a pointer to a struct, well, I know what you mean. What you really mean is to dereference P first and then access the field name. So I'll do that for you. So it's just saving you some typing. And so this also works. Okay, so you can be explicit like this, or you can sort of be a little bit more implicit, just give you some flexibility. But this is it. Again, no exercise for this. I think um, just sort of showing you and working through all the different slides and with the supplementer, with the review for the lecture, I think you should be good until we sort of get to a place where we, it makes sense to have a meaningful exercise. Check out the supplemental review for this lecture if you're still missing or you still think that you need some more information on dereferencing. Welcome to lecture four, section eight. In this lecture, we're gonna be looking at pointers and function. Some of the topics we're gonna to cover are what it looks like when you copy a pointer, and that means that when you pass a pointer to a function or you return a pointer from a function. Remember, in Go, you copy values anytime you pass them as parameter or when you return them. The only difference is that some data types make a deep copy and some make a shallow copy. So when you copy a map or a slice, for example, or a channel, that's a shallow copy. But if you copy a, an array, that's a deep copy. You have a completely new array. And so we've looked at that before. So we wanna see now what benefit does pointer give you when you copy in. And finally, we'll sort of make the case for pointers. Well. I hope we've made the case already, but we haven't really seen any particular use that tells us that pointers are a good idea. We've seen that's all what they are, you know, there's just memory location and a type. We've seen that we can navigate from values to pointers and vice versa, but we haven't really quite seen the benefit of even using a pointer. So far you think, well, okay, I've done a lot in Go without pointers, so I can probably do without it. So we're gonna try and make that case with an example. And we'll use this opportunity then to wrap up this section because there's much more that we can really talk about pointers. Even though it's such an important topic, I think we've covered sort of enough. Okay, let's jump into the code. So what I have is a variable called count and it has the value 1737. Now I'm printing out that value before I call this increment function. Then I call the increment function and give it the value of the variable. And then I print out the value of count after I call this function. All right, so let's run the code and see. And this is exactly what we should expect because we're making a copy and pass it into our ink function. So our ink function cannot update our count variable outside because it got a copy. So if we really want this ink function to be able to change our variable count, what we have to do is pass the address or pass, pass a pointer to our variable. We can just change this to say that V is a pointer to an int. In languages like C++, you are able to increment a pointer. And in Go, that is considered unsafe. So what would it mean to take the address and then be able to add one to it? So we cannot do that. So what we can do is dereference v now when we dereference v we get 
the value stored at this memory location, which is 1737. And because we are at that memory location, or we can access the memory location where the value is, we can increment that value. And it's the exact same as if we said star v and increment it and add one to it and store it back at that memory location. So now when we run this code, we should expect to see the expected results. So let's run it without clearing our screen. And there we go. This is exactly what we expect. So now you can see one benefit of using a pointer is so that you can make changes to values in memory by simply passing around the location or pointer to those values. So let's up our example a little bit and talk about something that is, I think, slightly more impressive. So let's look at another example. So I have this thing called a document, which is a structure. And let's pretend I'm writing a word processing application. So I manipulate documents, and documents have name, potentially, and the author who created the document, which is when it was created, when it was last modified. And then maybe I want some um, area of bytes where I can store the data. In this example, I'm going to use 100 megabits as the maximum amount of data I can store in my document, right? So it's 100 heat to the six, which is 100 megs. And so I create an array. Notice this, this is an array of this size. And then maybe I might want to be able to have some information about where my lines are. So as I process this document, I want to quickly jump to line one, six, and so on. Maybe I provide a feature for the user to say, go to line six and so on. And so if they say they want to go to line six, I want to be able to just look it up in a map, say they want to go to line six. And where is that in my set of, in my bytes, right? In my array. So this would be like return a number of the offset into my data. And same thing, you can imagine that if I'm thinking about pages, I also want to be able to allow you to jump to page six or seven. And again, quickly be able to jump to a location in my data that represents the start of page six or whatever that page is. For example, we have these defines for heading one. and I want to find all of my heading ones in the document. Well, I can go into this map and it would give me a listing of all those offsets where I have headings. And I don't know how many there are or the maximum. So I'm using a slice of int to offset. Okay. So this structure represent my fictitious, um, word processing document application and what I think a document might look at, look like and what the, the fields I need to manage a document. In main, what we do is we create a document variable. And so this gives me a valid document object. Notice it's not a pointer, it's just a variable. And now I want to print the size of it. Now in Go, there's this package called unsafe and you can use size of function from that package to tell you the size of value. So how many bytes in memory are going to be used to store that thing? And so in this case, I want to know how many bytes are going to be used to store a document. Now we can sort of guess the ballpark because if this is 100 megabytes, so at least 100 megs per document. So I have to be careful how I manipulate documents in my fictitious application. So I print out the size of a document. And then let's say there's some things that you often do in things like work pro process an application, right? You might want to count how many words are in the document. You open up a file, you don't know how many words are in there. You load it into this document object, and then you want to count any words. So you call this count word program. But notice, I'm just passing this as a value, not a pointer. We're not using pointer, it's just passing it as a value and returns how many words in my document. Well, I didn't actually implement this because this is just a illustration only. So inside my word count, I say, how big is a document? So because that's what's been passed the word count. So I print out the size again of this parameter. Okay. And then um, I just return some random value. So like I said, each time I use a document object, I'm going to be using whatever size that we see, um, you know, at least a hundred megabytes. So it's going to be a hundred megabytes in main, but since I call word count, I have to make a copy of 100 megabytes to be able to pass that to my word count. Another thing I might want to do is go through my document and do a capitalization, you know, of all heading ones, for example. So wherever I have a heading one, maybe it's not properly capitalized, I, I want to capitalize it. 
I mean, you might want to go into my document, say, well, print out a listing of all my headings. But these are one after the other. So maybe we can trust that the Go garbage collector will, you know, once I return from this function, probably clean up before I create another document so that I don't end up with like four documents or something. But all that is beyond our control. We don't get to control when the garbage collector runs. So, um, but this is how I wrote my application. These capitalize don't really do anything since I would be capitalizing the headers in the document. That means I'll be modifying the document. So I updated the modification, the modify time. You know, listing doesn't modify the document, neither does word content. So I don't modify the document. So let's run a code and see. If I run this, well, it seems to be taking some time, but uh, just as we suspect, 100 and something million bytes. So it's actually 100 million 104 bytes for me to capture what a document is, a document object. And so when I try to call count word, I have to copy all those 100 million bytes to that new variable that's going to be created for count word function so that it can count the word. And I have to do the same thing again when I call capitalize heading and do the same thing when I call list headings. So we don't know how long. It seems like it took a long time, but you know, at least we know that's what's going on. And we can prove this, um, that that's what's happening very soon. And we've done this already with structure, but we'll prove it again. So let's go back and modify our code a little bit more to see how we can start integrating pointers. But before we do that, we, there is a bug in our code. So let's fix the bug. So for us to see the bug in the code though, I need to do something. So I need to sort of do a little initialization of my document because before I just create a document object and I didn't really do anything with it other than when I call capitalize, I modify the time. So now I have this function called load doc and I'm pretending that oh, this is some source or the name of the, my document. And so let's see what load doc does. Well, it just creates a new document. And of course it has to return a document. So it creates and return a document. So what I've done is take our document object, which will be created. And I've initialized some of the fields and, you know, the source, I give it the name that we passed in and um, some time, the modification time is, and the create time is set to the current time. And then I put some data into our buffer or into the document. Now, you don't really have to worry too much about how I did it here, but this is just one way of using the standard bytes package to create a buffer. I can then write some data into that buffer using the formatted package, FMT package. And then I copy that data into, read that data into a section of our data. Again, don't really worry too much about it. This is not part of um, what you really need to learn. I'm just simply showing you um, how I initialize and load my document, but then I return my document. Okay, so now I've returned the document. I want to print that document and we can go take a look at print. Print is very simple. It's print the name of the document, when it was created, the date, and um, how many bytes have been used. You'll see when I run it, what I get. So these are the only two new functions I have it, print doc, load doc, and everywhere else, I just sort of, oh, for capitalize heading, what I did was actually try and capitalize. I assumed that oh, the first line in my document is a heading, and so I tried to capitalize it. And that's it. Let's run this code and see what the problem is, the bug that I referred to. You can see we got a document, we print it out, and we have chapter one as the first line of this document. And then notice what happened after I modified my document. I said capitalize the document, but, and I know I call it capitalize document because here it is that call. And then after I capitalize the document, I try to print out the document and my heading is not capitalized. And that is the bug. Uh, the problem is that when we capitalize our document, we get a copy of the document but we did not return it. So we can fix this by simply having capitalized heading return the updated document. So let's do that. So if you look at this code, I've just made some slight changes. Now my capitalized heading takes a document, modifies it just as before. And the only difference is that it returns that updated document. 
And I've added something else, which is some timing, because I want to see how long it takes for me to do all of this sort of processing or these action. So at the beginning of my program, after I load it, I'm not including the time it takes to load the document, because with regards of what you use, whether you use pointers or not, you still have to load the document. So I'm not including that time. I'm looking at the time when I start doing work on the document, like printing it out, passing it to a print function, and so on. And then at the end, after I've done things like listing, I look at how much time it took to do that. And so if we run our program now, okay, it's taking some time, but we can see that our capitalized um, heading function, this is working out. But this is taking a long time because we have to copy 100 megabytes every single time we call one of these functions. Now let's introduce pointers and let's see the difference. Notice it's taking us about half of a minute. So the first thing we'll notice that we haven't really changed much. Well, now our load doc returns two parameters. So let's go see what those two parameters are. And it actually returned a pointer instead of a document. It returns an error. And that's because while I can check my pointer value to see if it's nil or not, well, it's nice to also have the option of getting an error so you can get more rich information. And so I try to create a new document. And, but of course, I have to check and make sure that I can allocate that space because maybe at the time when this code is run, my computer doesn't have memory. And so I must check that I don't have a nil value. And if I do, I can return and say, okay, I, can't, I don't have a document and this is why I couldn't allocate it. Nothing else really changed. And I've done this for pretty much all my other functions since they all now take a pointer. I should check that oh, I don't have a nil pointer before I try to do anything. If I have a nil pointer, I simply return. And what else? Oh, capitalize heading. Since I'm taking a pointer to that document, I really don't need to return um, the pointer that I, I got because, well, it's the same exact value with this slight modification. Let's run this code and see. I remember before when we tried to run this code, it took about half a second. And look at this. It is a thousand times faster than before. Still works exactly the same way. Notice that before when I loaded my document, chapter, the heading was, you know, lowercase, and then I capitalized it. Same exact thing. So we could run this a few times and notice it returns essentially immediately. And that's because we've made it so that even though our document object is still 100 megabytes, notice the size that we, we're passing or copying to each function call. It goes down from 100 megabytes to just 8 bytes. That is how many bytes I need to represent a memory location or a pointer on my system. And so that's a significant um, saving. And you could see how much faster my program runs. So what else can we do? Well, one of the things we mentioned when we were playing with creating pointers and even dereferencing pointers was a pointer to a pointer. So is there ever a use for doing something like that? And in Go, I would say not really. Remember, you can do it. We did it. But for the most part, you don't need to. If you come from a C or C++ world, here's an example of why people sort of used um, pointer to pointer. So I've changed my code slightly. So what I've done is created a pointer variable, declare a pointer variable. And so my function load doc, instead of returning a pointer, accept a pointer to a pointer document. Why? Because it's going to populate or store a value in my pointer variable. So in order for it to store a value or update this variable, I have to pass a pointer to this variable. Hence why I'm taking the address of that variable. Now, why would I want my load doc to work this way? If you're limited to only returning one parameter, well then, if you want to modify any one of the parameters that you pass in, now you have to turn that into a point, right? Just like when we started off, in order to modify our count or, it, or um, the variable that contain our count, we had to pass a pointer, okay? And so this is what we're doing. So now we have to modify our code slightly. We have to check since we're getting a pointer. A pointer to our pointer is still a pointer. So we're getting a pointer, so we should check that it's not null before we try and use it. If it is null, we're going to say that oh, there's an invalid value for that parameter. We then try to allocate a document. And regardless of whether we got the document or not, we're going to store that in the pointer location that is being pointed to for us to store that pointer, right? The document that we're going to create. 
So that's why we dereference this, store our point of value in there, and then we check and see if we, we were able to allocate that document. If we were not able to, we return, but that's fine. Even so if we modify this with nil, because that's the correct thing to do to say, though, we really did not get to allocate the document you asked me to allocate or load the document. And then otherwise, we will have a non-nil value for doc, and we go through and we still modify it. Notice my code changed very slightly. Um, and since we're not returning it, well, then this is just one parameter. Everything else stays the same. So let's run this and see the difference. We should expect that it should still work, and it shouldn't be any faster or slower. Like, this doesn't really matter. We're not even testing um, the loading. And, yep, it's about the same. I guarantee you that I'll using a pointer to a pointer makes no difference other than making our code slightly harder to read. If you're comfortable with pointers, then this is not a big deal. If you're not too comfortable with pointers, try to stay away from too many pointer usage. But hopefully by now, you've seen that oh, there's a benefit to using pointers. You should be comfortable enough using at least one in direction. That's it for this lecture. I'll cover your lab in a supplemental video and a review of this section in a supplemental video. Take care. See you in the next lecture. Let's review your labs for section eight. I have two lab exercises. The first one is really taking the exercise from lecture four, section six, and then changing it slightly. And the only reason why is because since we already have in that exercise some timing associated with whole 100 megabits array, megabytes array, sorry, not megabits, megabytes array within the structure, no, it's the question is, what if we made the footprint of our structure even smaller instead of use a slice and then lazily create the storage for our um, document? Does that make a big difference? And so that's what the second, um, so that's what the first lab is really about. So let's take a look at it. So you want to compare whether using an array of bytes versus slice of bytes in the pointer to the structure really makes a difference. Okay, so that's the simple thing. Um, and so run, make the changes and run it. The app lab is um, something I find even more interesting. For if you're not from a computer science background, or if this is your very first programming course, then it's sort of unfair to ask you to do. But basically, in computer science, there's this well-known problem, and it's called the Dynan Philosopher's Problem. And it's meant to illustrate what can happen when you have concurrent algorithms that don't properly uh, work properly, right? And so you can click on this link or you can simply just go to your favorite search engine and look for Dynamic Philosopher Problem. And it'll take you to like Wikipedia is one of the places that you can um, see it. And if you look at this picture, basically what you have is just that. Five philosophers in this, the way the problem is posed, that are sitting around a table and they're dining. They're having dinner, let's say. And notice there's a fork between each professor, there's a fork between each two, between two professors. So the problem with this is for any one professor, so what do professors do? Uh, philosophers, sorry. The philosophers are going to think about stuff that they want, you know, that's interest to them or whatever they're talking, discussing, and then they can eventually get hungry and want to eat. So when a philosopher wants to eat, he needs to be able to pick up two forks in order to eat. He cannot eat with one fork. So that's a requirement is that a philosopher, the only thing they do is think and eat, think and eat. And so when a philosopher wants to eat, he needs to pick up two forks and then he can eat. And once he's finished eating, he's going to, of course, put back down the fork. We're not going to worry about hygiene for now. And so another professor wants to eat also the same thing, perfect two forks. So the problem with this, if it's not implemented, if you try to simulate it, is that you can imagine that each philosopher picks up a fork. I know there are no more forks on the table, but then each philosopher is now waiting for a second fork. And so that's a deadlock, okay? No progress can be made because each philosopher is waiting for a resource that the other is waiting for. And so um, you can't make any progress. And so um, there are a number of proposed solutions for this. And one of the proposed solutions, if you look at the Wikipedia article, is, and I'm not asking you to think through how to solve the problem. I'm telling you everything you need to know. One solution is the arbitrator. So you can introduce, like, say, a waiter who is going to be the person that philosopher have to ask for a fork first, and only if the, the waiter has the fork to give, then 
the waiter would say, okay, here are the two forks and then you can eat. Now in a way stated here, the waiter only allow one philosopher to eat at a time, but I think we can do much better. And so your lab, the second lab, is to implement this dining philosophy problem um, to simulate and show that this solution, the arbitrator solution, work and you can implement it in Go. And so um, this is what I say here, modify the arbitration solution so that um, you, you can allow two philosophers to eat at the same time, of course, right? Because you have five forks and each philosopher only need two forks. So with that, if you think about it, um, we can do this with pointers. Why with pointers? Because if the waiter has a set of forks, five forks, we don't want to be creating forks. It's the same five forks that you want to pass around to each philosopher. Okay, so by having the waiter manage pointers to forks, then the waiter can just pass around references to these forks. And so think about it and think about how you would illustrate this problem. Remember, your philosopher, have your philosopher be a function that is run by a Go routine. So you have to create five philosopher, and each philosopher again is a function that just simply, simply implement thinking and eating. And the way I did that is by sitting in a for loop for some time, uh, because you can let this program run forever, but from, in my solution, I just wanted to run for some time. So I have the time, um, let's say I grab some time and I say, well, we're going to dine for 10 minutes. Okay, the philosopher is going to dine for 10 minutes. And so each philosopher has this time of how long they should dine. And for that time, they're going to sit in a for loop and they're going to do, should I think or should I eat? Again, that's very easy to do because we've done random number in this course so many times. So it should be fairly easy for you to be able to get a random number and then decide whether or not you're going to, depend on a random number, easiest thing is to take the modulus of two and your result is going to be zero or one and then use that to decide whether or not you should think or eat. So you can think of it as like flipping a coin in your for loop. Each time you go wrong, you flip a coin and then if it's zero you're going to think for example and you spend some time thinking right so you, again you grab some random time and you say okay there's a long i go to sleep and this is me thinking this is my philosopher thinking and then when you finish you go back around and you flip the coin again and if it's one this time then it means that i'm going to eat this time and now you need to ask the waiter the arbitrator for two forks the requirement is that your waiter must always return two forks. If waiter cannot return one fork because you cannot eat with one fork. Okay. And if you return, return two forks, well, what if it doesn't have two forks? Well, then you're blocked because you want to eat. You are blocked. You're not going to go back to thinking until you eat. Okay. So you're going to block until your waiter uh, returns a fork. So in other words, the waiter doesn't return. That call to get two forks on the waiter does not return until the waiter has two forks to give you. And so the number of ways to solve this problem one hint I can give you is consider using a channel. If the waiter is using a channel to manage the forks, then the waiter can say, well, okay, if I'm going to try and get two forks from a channel, and if I can get it, then I retrieve the two forks and return it when asked for forks. And then when somebody gives me back forks, I just put it back in the channel. And so the channel capacity would be the number of forks you have, which is five in this case. And then you, you also simply have to just think through what would happen if there's just one fork the way to try to get a fork from the channel, two forks, able to get one, but can I get a second one? So how does the way to deal with that? Okay. And so this is all stuff we've covered already with in section seven and six, when we talk about go routine and how to wait and um, channels and how to time out and so on. So all those things come together with pointers in this lab. If you're having difficulty, definitely post questions, look online for other solutions. And of course, the solution I've created is provided.